Hi, and welcome to the Orvis Fly Fishing Guide podcast. A little bit later in the show, we're going to be talking to Dr. Russ Carpenter, who is a neurobiologist who specializes in um, the neurobiology of fishes, and specifically rainbow trout. So um, this is going to be, I think, an interesting podcast for you because we're going to talk about um, lots of questions that I get, uh, fish hearing, fish vision, fish sense of smell, uh, the effect of the moon and the sun, and barometric pressure on trout. And I have to tell you that I learned so much on this podcast interview, and it's changed the way, already changed the way I think of certain things, and it changed my opinion on some things uh, in relation to the effects of um, of weather and other conditions on uh, on fishing. So uh, I think you're going to enjoy it. I know I did, and I'm excited to uh, bring this podcast to you. But first, let me try to answer some questions. Let's go into the fly box, and you can send questions into the fly box. You can send me an email or a voicemail file to podcast at orvis.com, or you can leave a message on the answering machine at 802-362-8800. So love to hear your questions, and I'm running a little low on good questions. So um, the best questions are simple questions, problem-solving questions, um, not really open-ended questions like how do I avoid drag, um, but questions where you've had a situation where um, – things didn't work out quite right and you want some suggestions on how to make it better. So anyway, that's what I'm here for to help uh, make your fishing more fun. Hey Tom, this is Paul calling from Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'm calling him. Uh, I got a couple questions. The first one being, uh, I'd like you to talk about weather and overcast versus sunny. How does that affect trout and their feeding be- behavior, um, rain, everything like that. The second question is, I guess, just general expectations. You know, I see all these videos of people going out. It seems like they're catching trout after trout. Um, What would you say is a reasonable expectation to have? Obviously, there's a lot of variables in play, but, you know, if we're going four hours without catching a fish, is that normal? So, Paul, I I don't think there is ever a reasonable expectation when you go fishing, any kind of fishing. I I don't – it's just not possible. Um, Don't have any expectations. That's the best – that's the best advice I can give you. I have fished for 12 hours on many days and not caught a fish. And yes, I'm disappointed, and yes, I get frustrated, but it's going to happen, and it's going to happen lots of times. Um, and e- even the weather, even the weather, it's, it really depends on the time of year and the fish you're fishing for. Um, you know, sometimes sunny days, particularly in the early season, uh, when the water's really cold, sunny days are going to be the best time to fish. And um, then later on, as the season progresses and water gets warmer, and it's at a nice temperature for trout or whatever species of fish you're pursuing, um, cloudy days are sometimes much better. My favorite, my very favorite fishing day is on the beginning of a warm front when you have a warm, drizzly rain with no wind. That would be my ideal fishing day. I mean, it's nice to be out on sunny days, and I I love that, but boy, um, those darker days can sometimes be quite spectacular. Let's read some emails. The first one is from Shelby from Kilgore, Texas, who is an avid listener of the podcast. Thanks so much for the quality content that you and Orvis produce for the fly fishing community. I hope to be able to introduce myself to you one day. I have two questions for you. My first is about split thread dubbing technique. When I am spinning the bobbin to flatten the thread, I can never seem to get the thread to flatten the entire length of the exposed thread, roughly from shank to bobbin. 
When I split the flattened thread with my bodkin, inevitably I only end up with two to three inches split open, which makes it a tad difficult to add in dubbing material. I'm able to manage, but would like some pointers on how to improve this technique. Does style or quality of bobbin have any impact on this? By the way, I'm typically using 70 to 140 denier ultra thread and an Orvis curved bobbin. Um, well, I, I don't think it's your bobbin or your thread, Shelby, and I don't use the split uh, thread dubbing technique much. I generally tie in a loop or just dub directly onto the thread. So I went to the expert, Tim Flagler, to get some tips, and uh, this is Tim's response. Try squeezing the flattened thread all the way up to the hook nice and tight, and then slide your fingers down the thread toward the nozzle of your bobbin. This should cause the bobbin to continue to spin counterclockwise and uncord the complete length between the hook and your bobbin. Hope this helps, Tim. So hopefully that helped you, Shelby. And now on to your second question. The second question is about screw-in studs for wading boots. I recently purchased some Orvis Pro wading boots, and the guys in the retail shop did not seem to think I would need studs. What's your opinion on adding studs? Is it just personal preference, or does the latest sole technology make that big of a difference? Thanks again for the podcast. I look forward to your answers. So um, it really depends, of course. I always say it depends because it does. Um, depends on what kind of what kind of water you're fishing. If you're fishing mostly sand, gravel, um, mud, weeds, whatever, and you're doing a lot of hiking, you can probably get away without studs. Um, but the the new sole technology, even the Michelin sole and the Pro boots, um, although it's much grippier than any other sole material, I think uh, still needs studs if you're fishing a lot of slippery rocks, particularly round boulders. Um, round boulders with lots of algae on them, um, I, I would not go without studs. So you can take studs in and out. You can screw them and unscrew them. It's kind of a pain, but you can do it. Um, but um, I don't think if you're fishing rivers with big rocks and slippery rocks, um, I th don't think you should just rely on a rubber sole. I think you're going to need to stud them. Um, if you're if you're not fishing that kind of water, then you're probably okay. Here's an email from Matt. I hope you and the good folks at Orvis are well. I'm writing with a handful of questions that I would appreciate your opinion on. I think I'm all caught up on past podcasts and will often go back to re-listen to the interviews as a way to get my mind right for a fishing trip. I do most of my fishing in Virginia and West Virginia and live in the mountains just north of Roanoke. So without further ado, here goes. Over the past year or so, I have gotten into tying and fishing soft tackle type plies. I find them enjoyable to tie and fun to fish. How important is it to match the hatch when fishing soft tackles? I assume the same basic variables apply. Size, color, basic profile, but my soft tackles tend to be slim. I often tie them with a bead to get a two fly rig down deeper. Will using the bead or adding split shot to the line inhibit the swinging action that I'm going for? When fishing multiple soft tackle flies, should I follow the same principles as I would for multiple nymph rigs? In my opinion, a podcast dedicated to soft hackles would be right up my alley and may interest a good many other anglers as well. Love the podcast and enjoy your Instagram posts. My five-year-old daughter, however, thinks the podcast the most boring thing ever. Well, so does my 14-year-old son, Matt. Um, the mere sound of your voice invariably causes her to exclaim, Not Tom Rosenbauer! Um, yeah, there, there are some spouses who feel the same way as your daughter. Um, so, your question. I don't think it's that important to match the hatch. Um, you know, you never know which, what the fish are feeding on anyway, unless you see fish specifically keying into a cream-colored size 16 mayfly and you want to fish soft tackles. Uh, I wouldn't worry about it because there's always lots of, there's always lots of caddisflies and a and, and other mayflies, and I think um, fish sometimes take soft tackles because they think they're small bait fish, little tiny bait fish fry. So not sure how important it is. It wouldn't hurt to try to match the general size and, and uh, coloration of uh, the flies you see hatching, but I don't think it's always that necessary. 
um, regarding the weight on the flies. I have personally found that beadhead flies don't swing, don't fish as well, don't swing as well as a, a soft tackle without a bead. I, I'd love to be able to put beads on more of my soft tackles because it gets them down a little bit and it kind of slows them down the current. But I honestly don't find weighted soft tackles as effective as uh, a standard unweighted soft tackle on a, um, on a fine tippet, uh, usually fluorocarbon to help sink it a little bit. And I don't know why, but um, it must be something about the swinging action. So you can try the beads. You can try split shot on your line. It'll work sometimes. Um, but I've found that um, more often than not, I find myself going to unweighted soft tackles and doing better. And regarding the same principles as multiple nymph rigs, as I said in, in last week's podcast, I find that if I'm fishing multiple soft tackles and swinging them, uh, I find I get many more strikes by not tying to the bend of the first fly, but putting a separate dropper on the tippet, either leaving a tag end of your tippet long or tying in an extra piece of, uh, of fluorocarbon or monofilament with a, um, with a triple surgeon's knot. I just, I just find it works better, and I don't know why it must be the way they swim. Here's an email from Matthew. I love the podcast and was hoping you could answer a question for me, for me that I can't seem to find any real good advice on. I just picked up a new Clearwater 9 foot 4 weight and paired it with the Batten Keel 2 reel. I'm excited to get out this spring on my home waters, which are the Driftless area in Wisconsin with this outfit. I typically catch wild browns in the 10 to 14 inch range, but occasionally hook up with a fish in the 16 to 20 inch range. In the past, larger fish have come on the bugger and leech patterns, and I'm usually fishing tippet of 6 to 10 pound breaking strength at the time. My question is, when landing these larger fish, should I be letting them run? I haven't yielded any line in the past, but I always let the fish fight the rod. Am I missing something? If my tippet can handle it and my rod isn't near the breaking point, is there a reason to let a fish run before getting them to the net? Usually I just reel them in and scoop them up as fast as I can. My thoughts are, if I let them run out line, it will just give them more opportunity to get wrapped around something, and it could also unnecessarily exhaust the fish. Thanks for your thoughts. Well, Matt, I, I think you're exactly right. Um, you're always going to have a better chance of releasing a fish if you get it in as quickly as your tackle allows. And just letting a fish run to let it run is, is going to increase your chances of the fish going into a snag and if you can if you can get them in with with the tippet size you have and the rod you have then uh don't worry about letting them run you only let them run when they have to run and you'll know it because you won't be able to what well, a fish that a fish that really wants to run um you won't be able to stop it um so if if they're not literally pulling line out of your hand and then pulling line off the reel um, they're the ones that decide, and if they're not doing it, you don't need to let them run. So I think you're doing everything just perfectly um, the way you've been doing it. Here's an email from Chris. Hi, Tom. Thanks for everything you do. I recently got the quadfecta fly fishing some delayed harvest waters in North Carolina, being a bro rainbow, brook, Scottish brown, and German brown. At least that's what my buddy said. But I'm wondering, how do you tell the difference between the two strains of stock browns? Is it the red spots? Thanks again. Um, well, Chris, this is a the the strains of brown trout are a holdover from the early days uh, back in the 1880s, between the 1880s and the turn of the century, when brown trout were first introduced in the United States. There were um, there was a strain from Germany um, that had um, not many spots, but big spots, and a little more red on the adipose fin, and they're a little stockier fish. And then there was a strain from a lake in Scotland that were uh, a little bit slimmer, and they had lots of smaller spots, not those big spots. And those were the original strains. But um, in the well over 100 years that brown trout have been raised in hatcheries and stocked in the United States, um, those fish have 
really been all mixed up. And even in the wild, when they reproduce naturally, uh, they crossbred quite, uh, they're the same species, and they, they crossbred bred quite readily. So, um, you know, sometimes you'll see a trout that has more of the um, von Baer, the German strain, it seems to have more dark black spots, and you'll find others that will have um, more smaller spots, the Loch Leven, um strain of brown trout. But I think most of those disappearances have been, have real, or most of those characteristics have been uh, um, interbred, and um, you know you'll still see some fish that that show various characteristics. But um, you know uh, it, it's interesting. I remember seeing an electroshocking on the Batten Kill many years ago, and there were a bunch of brown trout that were electroshocked from a pool, and the range in in color and and these are all wild brown trout, well stream bred brown, but the range in the color of the fish and the spot patterns and the spot positioning and the amount of red in the adipose fins was all over the place. And these were all wild fish from a single pool. So um, I don't think, uh, I mean, you can you can say you caught a German brown and a Scottish brown, but I think most people don't make that distinction anymore. Here's an email from Danny from Arizona. Thank you for years of effort putting this podcast together. I found it not long after I started fly fishing and found it to be worth its weight in gold. You can send me some gold if you want, Danny. I had a question about casting the spooky fish. I live in Arizona where we encounter low clear water conditions a lot sooner than most of the rest of the country. It seems that some of these trout can hear you close the car door from miles away. Stealth is always considered and I often sneak to within casting distance to the fish but as soon as even a 12-foot leader hits the water, the fish dart for cover. They would be readily feeding under the, on the surface or picking off nymphs side to side under the surface, so I know they were active. So are these fish just uncatchable? Is there another level of ninja I am yet to get to? Danny, you know, I, I know some fish in certain places that I consider almost uncatchable, and so I feel your pain. There's a few things you can do. Um, one is, if I find fish like that, um, I'll often go really early in the morning or uh, just before dark when they lose a little bit of their caution and they feed a little bit more aggressively. Um, that may help. Rainy days, drizzly, drizzly days, cloudy days, they'll be a little less spooky. Um, it sounds like you're, you're plenty stealthy enough um, you might try, if you're always fishing downstream of them, you might try getting upstream and throwing it so that, throwing your cast with a, with a curve cast or a reach cast so that the fly goes over the fish before the leader and the tippet and the line. Um, but you have to be really careful because you're, you're approaching them from above. Sometimes that'll work. If you're always approaching them from above, try coming directly downstream of them and just throwing the tippet. Uh, over their heads with, again, a, a reach cast or a curve cast so that, uh, you know, the f just a fly and a little bit of the tippet goes over their heads. I have um, I've experienced times when even a 12-foot leader would spook trout. Uh, it's the fly line. Fly line lands so much harder than a leader that I'll often extend my 12-foot uh, leaders to 15 or even 18 feet, and you just... Uh, just add some butt section to the leader. And you also might try um, putting a longer tippet on. If you're normally using a two-foot tippet, go to a four or five-foot tippet. A little bit harder to straighten, but you don't always want it to straighten anyways. Um, and one more thing, if you're, if you're using nylon tippet material, some people believe that fluorocarbon is a little more stealthy because it's less visible and it sinks. So uh, try those things, but I think that probably uh, time of day um, is going to be your biggest friend in trying to get those fish. And also, um, if you can if you can uh, hit the fish when they're in the middle of a heavy hatch, if you do have heavy hatches and they're feeding aggressively, uh, fish lose a lot of their caution when they're feeding heavily on a hatch. They're not very good at multitasking, and they're often a lot less alert when they're... Um, when they're feeding heavily on a hatch. So those are a few things to try. But 
um, there are there are certain fish and certain pods of fish in certain places that can be almost uncatchable. I don't want to say they're totally uncatchable because you'll find somebody that can catch them one way or the other. Here's an email from Jack from Jacksonville, Florida. When tying saltwater weed guards, what's your ideal size of monofilament and method? I find the V to be accessible, and I'm always wondering if single or over the bend prevent fish from getting that solid bite on the inhale. Um, you know what I like, Jack? Um, I like using the V um, for a weed guard, and I, I got a trick from my buddy Aaron Adams from Bonefish Tarpon Trust that I use on all my bonefish and redfish flies. And um, I take a I take a loop of uh, take a loop of monofilament or fluorocarbon. Usually about yeah, 16 pound test I find is good, 16 or 20 depending on the size of the hook, and uh, uh, fold it in half, and then I put a little crimp in the in the bend of the uh, of the weed guard. It just helps helps it tie in because. Um, the the round if it's if you tie it in when it's round it tends to roll around so I put a crimp in it so that it's flattened and then I uh, put that over the over the hook and tie it in and I might figure eight it to get it at the right angle and what I want is um, is I want the weed guard to point to go right just shy of the point of the hook as far as the angle is concerned. But I want it to be a bit longer than uh, than than the distance to the point. So it might they might extend maybe twenty or thirty percent beyond the point of the hook, but above it. Hope this is this is hard to hard to explain. It's going to be in it, the technique is going to be in my new fly tying book that's out in July, so you can find it in there. But anyway. Um, once you get that tied in and secured and it's pointing, you got the V, you know, both pieces of monofilament are on either side of the hook point and you got everything set. Um, then you can um, put some UV glue or head cement on the head to lock that in place at that angle. And then what, what Aaron does is he takes a pair of forceps and he grabs the monofilament just above the hook point and bends it at about... 45 degrees so that it's parallel to the um, the bend, not the bend, parallel to the bottom part of the hook, the part where the point and the bar bar. And what that does is it allows the fly to slide over weeds and rocks, pieces of limestone and coral and stuff, but there is very little distance between the end of the weed guard and that hook point because all the fish need to do is depress that thing just slightly and the hook point's going to be exposed. So um, that's the that's the weed guard I like to use. And again, if, if this is difficult for you to visualize, um, it'll be in my fly tying book that's coming out in um, July. Or maybe I should do an Instagram post on that. I might do that before the book comes out. Here is an email from John from Scott Valley, California. Tom, Josh Jenkins said we could send questions to him about fly lines. Can you forward this to him? What is the maximum temperature water I should use for dyeing my fly line with RIT dye? I always dye my lines moss green or equivalent for spooky tailwater fish. It makes a difference in my favor. I dislike the highly visible colors most lines come in. Thank you. Thanks to both of you and Orvis for the terrific work you're doing to help us enjoy our sport and take good care of where we fish. So this is Josh's answer, John. As far as I'm aware, most RIT dye users will transfer color with boiling water. He shouldn't have an issue up to 212 degrees Fahrenheit for dyeing purposes. You really don't want to get above 325 degrees Fahrenheit for long periods of time. But that's pretty much pretty hard to do when you're boiling water. So I think you're going to be safe to uh, just boil water and, and uh, dye your fly lines using RIT. Hey, Tom, it's Peter from Tucson, Arizona. Um, I fish the uh, Colorado River at Lee's Ferry, which is the tailwater fishery, as you know. Um, it's mostly uh, midge uh, fishing, uh, zebra midges on an indicator. 
I was fishing one day in the evening, and the fish were porpoising and rising, but I couldn't see what they were taking. I tried uh, my usual zebra midges. I tried the tiniest little dry fly that I could find, but was unable to hook up. I wonder if you had any suggestions for what what the fish might be uh, what might be taking, and um, what methods I might try to do to uh, tackle this the next time. Thanks a lot. So, Peter, I think I know exactly what the problem is, and it's seldom that I that I hear one of these questions when I know exactly how to solve a problem, but I think I do on this one. Um, what I believe you're seeing were fish taking midge pupae in the surface film. So, unfortunately, when you tried, you were fishing either too high or too low. So, your zebra midges are probably weighted. They probably got a little tungsten bead on the end. And even if they don't, zebra midge sinks pretty quickly. So you're fishing below those fish when they're, when they're sipping on the surface like that. And when you're fishing a dry fly, you were fishing um, a little bit too high and kind of above the surface of the water if you're using a conventional dry fly. And um, what you should have been doing, I think, is fishing a midge pupa right in the surface film. So midge pupa, very simple fly. You don't want any weight on it, no bead. Um, you want to tie it on a dry fly hook, and you just want um, just want a little bit of fur for a head and maybe a, a quill or a thread body. Um, if you don't uh, tie your own flies, um, you should be able to find some midge pupa imitations. Uh, if you can't, you can cut all the hackle and the wing off a, a dry fly and cut the tail off too, and that should work. And then to fish that, there are a couple ways you can do it. One is you can tie a dropper to the, you can use a little dry fly, like a Griffiths gnat, which the fish might take, and uh, use that for your indicator and tie a little piece of like 6X fluorocarbon onto the bend of that and tie your um, midge pupa on the end of that because you won't see the fish take the fly. It'll be slightly under the surface. It'll be just suspended in the film or just slightly under the surface. And it's hard to tell. You know, you can strike when you see a rise in the general area of where your fly is because the rise will still be visible or be a bulge. Um, But having a dry fly um, or a little tiny strike indicator above that will tell you when uh, a fish has taken your fly. The other thing you can do is you can um, grease your leader all the way up to within about six inches of the fly. Just put some paste fly dressing uh, on the leader. That'll allow the last little bit of the tippet to sink, and the rest of the leader will float, and you can watch the floating leader for twitches. Or, again, uh, since you can see your leader, you're going to know about where the fly is. You can just set the hook when you see a a bulge in the general area of your fly. So I think next time you encounter that, just try a, try a midge pupa. You were just a little bit too high and a little bit too low on your range. All right. Got a few more emails. First one's from James from Madrid, Spain. Greetings from Madrid. In 1989, I visited the Hardy factory in Alnick with my parents and my parents bought me a Hardy Smuggler rod, eight and a half foot, six weight. Eight foot, no, eight foot, two inch, two and a half inches, six weight, with a Hardy Princess reel for my 21st birthday. A beautiful rod and reel, which is still in use. Eight pieces, yet a great soft action. I have had the same. Six weight double taper line for 30 years, but I feel it's about time to change lines. Do you think a six weight 30 years ago is still a six weight in 2021, or with advantages in line technology, etc., would I be better with a four? Um, yeah, I think um, I think James, you you can stick with the uh, the six weight uh, line because um, you know there's been a standard for fly lines that is. Uh, been in use since about the 1960s and my impression is fly lines have gotten a little bit heavier to the heavier side of the standard so there's a standard uh, weight and grains for the first 35 feet of the line and um, manufacturers have generally stuck to that since the 60s Um, but uh, generally with graphite rods becoming stiffer and stiffer They've slowly gone toward the high side 
uh, of those of those standards. And a lot of sixes today are really six and a halfs. But um, yeah, you could go with a six weight or or a five weight. The best thing to do would be take the rod into a fly shop or an Orvis store and cast it with a six and cast it with a five. I do think a four four weight would be um, underlining the rod and might not bring out the action that you like in that rod. Here's an email from Dustin. Over Easter weekend, I fished the Saco River on the New Hampshire side, and I have two questions. First, the guide had me fish sculpins on a really light fly line with a really long leader. Fishing this setup reminded me of nymph fishing on a high water with a, a short jig motion on the retrieve. The concept was to bounce the sculpin down the rocks with the current. I've never fished this way before, but made a lot of sense given the water was high and the fish deep hiding in pockets. The guide mentioned he'd been fishing this way for a while in early spring on the Saco before the full might of snow melt kicks in and eventually the tubers arrive. I am wondering, is this a thing? And what kind of line setup should I have to replicate this technique? Well, Dustin, um, you know, we talked about this technique uh, a number of podcasts ago. If you go earlier this year and look up the podcast I did with um, Dominic Swintoski, um, he talked about it's really tight lining, um, sort of like nymph fishing with a streamer, dead drifting a streamer with a little bit of jigging motion. And um, you can use you can use almost any rod, but probably a, a longer, uh, softer rod is gonna gonna be a little bit more sensitive, so you can detect strikes. Um, but the long leader is key, and having a heavily weighted fly. Um, but go, why don't you go back and listen to that podcast, and you can hear. Um, something about how he uses that technique. My second question is about stocking. Our guide seems very convinced that all the rivers and tributaries around the White Mountains would greatly benefit from eliminating stocking to encourage native species. He thinks the stock fish do more harm than good, and if native fish had better genetics, had a better chance to thrive, these rivers would improve and become more notable fishing destinations. What is your opinion on stocking here? To me, given the light demand on these rivers, it seems kind of pointless and dated to stock at this point. Um, you know, there, there are times and places for stocking, Dustin, and, and um, I'm not a biologist, and I'm not a, a fishery manager, but um, in streams that can support wild trout, stocking is generally detrimental and um, you know it, it's unfortunate that states and federal government do sometimes stock trout in streams that that support wild trout um, they feel that the stockies are a little easier to catch and um, they want to supplement the wild fish that are there but it, it's often to the detriment of the wild fish I don't think the I don't think they screw up the genetics much because the stock fish often don't um, mate with the wild fish or reproduce um, but it's it's kind of uh, I don't know I don't I don't like fishing a wild trout stream and and encountering some stock fish with with no pectoral fins it kind of ruins the experience for me um, but there's a time and place for stocking um, if rivers get really warm during the summer and they can't support trout uh, for 12 months a year and the fish don't reproduce then um, stocking is a necessary tool if we're going to have trout fishing. Um, if not, if you don't stock rivers like that, then um, you are not going to have trout fishing. You might have some pretty good smallmouth bass fishing, which can tolerate uh, warmer water conditions. Uh, so, um, you know, it really, it really varies with the, uh, with the habitat and with the philosophy of the uh, fishery managers on duty there. Here's an email from Steve. Thanks for all you've taught me. Love the podcast and several of the books you've authored. Question, does the phase of the moon affect the ability to catch fish? Do fish feed better at night when the moon is full than when the moon is new? And if so, would it be best not to fish in the morning when the moon is full since the fish have been feeding the night before and would not be as hungry? If I was planning a trip to go fishing, should I avoid days when the moon is full? Is there a difference between fishing for trout versus bonefish? So I can, um, I I'm not going to answer the first part of your question because um, it's going to be a a big part of the the uh, interview that's coming up, and um, 
I, I would have given you a different answer before I had done this interview. So I'm going to let you listen to uh, the effect of the moon from, uh, from the expert on fish neurology and fish conditions. Um, there is one thing... Uh, there's one thing to be aware of if you're bone fishing, if you're going bone fishing, um, and that that I do know from experience and from talking to scientists. Um, most bone fish spawn on a full moon between November and March, in the full moons of the months of November, December, January, February, March. And um, in those cases, you can find the flats don't have as many bonefish. Now, they're not going to all spawn on the same full moon, and they're not going to all spawn at exactly the same time. But if you do fish on a full moon, you have, you have some pretty strong tides and some, sometimes some good tides, but you also have to realize that <clears throat> some of those fish are going to be offshore somewhere because when bonefish spawn, they go offshore into deep water, and they, they might travel many, many miles uh, to get to these spawning aggregations as Bonefish Tarpon Trust has uh, discovered in the past 10 years or so. So um, I try to avoid uh, bonefishing on a full moon just because I know there's not going to be, potentially not going to be as many fish on the flat as there would be during a non-full moon period. Uh, Here's an email from Zach. Last summer and late July, I was fishing fairly far up in the headwaters of a Lake Ontario tributary east of Toronto for trout. I was surprised to see some large steelhead this far up river and at this time of year. What's going on here? Love to hear your thoughts. Thanks. Well, Zach, I don't know exactly what's going on, but I suspect that you've found yourself uh, a summer run of steelhead. Steelhead, uh, different strains of steelhead run at different times. Some of them run in the spring. Some of them go back and forth. They run and they go back, they run, they go back, they run, they go back. Some of them run streams in the fall. Some of them run streams in the wintertime. Um, they mostly spawn in the spring, although some spawn in the fall. Um, some hatchery strains spawn in the fall. But there are strains of summer run steelhead um, in the Great Lakes. I don't think there are um, many streams that host summer runs. They sometimes call them scamanias. But my advice to you would be to plan a fishing trip um, this July and don't tell anybody where that stream is because you're probably not going to have any competition or any fishing pressure on those fish. And they're typically very aggressive and very hot fish, so you should should have a good time. Uh, Here is an email from Ed in Powell, Ohio. Tom, I have never had the opportunity to fish, or even just cast for that matter, any of the Orvis top-of-the-line bamboo rods. Aesthetically, I'm sure it would be awesome on an emotional and metaphysical level, kind of like riding a unicorn. But I can't imagine that their performance could be anywhere near even the lower-end glass or carbon poles that Orvis manufactures. I'm sure you have a few of these bamboo rods, but do you ever really fish with them, given that you can probably fish with any of the H3 rods in the name of doing research? And yes, I can, Ed. Not only do we have a great uh, loaner program here at Orvis where we can sign out any, any rod that we make, um, I also work with the product developers a lot and get to play with some of the new stuff. However, that being said, um, I'll sometimes spend weeks and weeks during the summer fishing small streams here in Vermont uh, only using my bamboo rod. Um, it's it's not better and it's not worse than a graphite or a fiberglass rod. It's just different. And it's a different casting feel. It's a, I think it's a wonderful feel. It's it's slower. It's more relaxed. It's um, you know it's the difference between uh, fishing with a st- relatively stiff, hollow synthetic tube and a solid uh, wooden object that has some mass. So the the the, the casting stroke and the feel of playing a fish um, is much different and I love it and um, it's probably not as efficient as a graphite rod but I I really enjoy uh, fishing my bamboo rods and I think that's something that you should you know that everyone should at least try once if you need to borrow one from someone or you have a friend who has one um they are they're wonderful fishing tools, and there's a special special feel to bamboo. It's, I think it's the reason that a lot of fish, people fish fiberglass. Their fiberglass rods are probably not as efficient 
as a modern graphite rod, um, but they have a different feel because they're heavier and they got more mass and um, they just they just have a different feel and they're really nice for close in work and so um, bamboo is similar but it, it is different and it is a lot of fun <clears throat> all right final email from joel just i just listened to the recent recent josh nugent episode that's hard to say it's so good to hear someone get so excited about so many fish that he couldn't catch. The thrill of the hunt. Being able to capture and keep a fish's attention regardless of whether or not you hook them. Yeah, buddy. A true angler's angler. Cheers. Well, thank you, Joel. It was nice of you to say. And I will pass that along to my buddy, Josh. All right. So we're done with that. We're done with the fly box. Let's go and listen to some really eye-opening thoughts about fish behavior. So my guest today is Russ Carpenter, and Russ contacted me through the, the podcast mailbox and said, hey, you get a lot of questions about, um, about fish uh fish senses and vision and hearing in particular and smell and uh, I happen to have a PhD in uh, neurobiology of fish. I studied rainbow trout and an African cichlid and I said whoa that's cool let's do a podcast and uh, so Russ is a, a lecturer at Stanford and lectures in science communication and fly fishing. Did you know you can get credit at Stanford for taking a fly fishing course. That's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> so Russ, welcome to the podcast and thank you for reaching out to me. Thanks for having me, Tom. Let's let's talk about the senses of fish and in particular trout. And we're talking about rainbow trout, right? Because those right. are the ones you studied, and uh, we're we're going to assume that brown trout and brook trout and cutthroats are going to be relatively similar. Can we make that assumption? That's a safe assumption. Okay. All right. So um, let's talk about let's talk about the sense of smell first. Can trout okay. smell? Of course, absolutely. Trout can. They have an acute sense of smell. Uh, we see this in homing behavior. Well, we know famously in the Salmonids group, uh, these anadromous uh, trout that go out to the ocean and come back, return to the natal stream, a big part of that, the majority of that is done through the sense of smell. And do they use their sense of smell for feeding as well, which is more important to us, I guess? Yes, certainly they do. Uh, the majority of food that trout eat tend to be insects, floating to them in the current, so they're highly visual uh, predators, but they also have the ability to smell things. Uh, your common uh, worm and bobber fisherman knows that fairly well. A uh, trout can cue in on a bait pretty quickly coming from the downstream orientation, so water is a fairly good uh, medium for scent to travel in, and a trout can use that to locate of prey items when they're not sort of sitting outside of the current and feeding on things that come past. Do you think? Um, do you think in the current uh, when we're fishing for trout, we're usually fishing in a current if we're not lake fishing? Um, do you think they would reject a nymph that smells heavily of UV resin or head cement, or is that just is just not gonna not gonna be a factor in moving water? I personally don't think it would affect them taking a fly and then spitting it back out. I think that I, you often see trout uh, feeding on, on little sticks and uh, small pieces of debris that are floating in the current, and so they'll take it and then spit it back out. Mm -hmm. I think that's more of a feel response than a smell response. So I, I don't think it's a primary factor. It's not something that I worry about. There's a lot of conversation about bananas, and people say don't take a banana on a fishing boat. There are a lot of reasons that people have for that, but one of them is fish can recognize that smell. Uh, another sunscreen, you know, be careful to wash the sunscreen off your hand, but I think that really the sunscreen issue is more about degradation to the fly line mm -hmm. than about yep. fish being able to smell it on a fly as some residue. Okay. A mosquito spray is the same thing. I'm not, I'm not 
crazy about making sure my hands are are completely scent free when I'm tying on a fly. It's not something I worry about. Okay, might be more of a factor if you're say fishing for bonefish where there there isn't current, right? Absolutely, and and, and salt like that, I think that in those flats, a scent can be a predictor. Uh, I think that another way that scent plays a role in fish lives is in social interaction. Um, uh-huh. this, the ability of a fish to produce pheromones and then, I mean, frankly, they, they pee. And if through that pee, they're sending chemosensory information or uh, chemical information to each other uh, that's providing them some information about uh, the readiness of a potential mate or the, the aggression level of a potential competitor. And so I know this through the work in cichlids that we've done that depending on your territorial and dominant status in the hierarchy, you will forcibly urinate uh, on a, in a social interaction more or less and uh, males that are territorial versus males that are non-territorial and thus non, non-dominant. Uh, have differing abilities in the brain to smell. Uh, the sense receptors are up, upregulated in dominant individuals. Same with females. Females that are uh, ready, gravid with eggs, ready to reproduce, have a more uh, heightened sense to smell these chemosensory signals coming from dominant males. Mm-hmm. And then once they're um, with, uh, have laid eggs, and, and these cichlids I study are mouth brooders, so they've got a mouthful of eggs, they don't have the same sensitivity to the smell from a dominant male because they're not ready to mate. Huh. Okay. Do you think do you think trout can can smell a hatch? Do you think that that's is there a cue perhaps um, when a hatch starts you, you know you notice that the trout will will really key into a hatch quite quickly and will will be almost ready for it. Um mm-hmm. Do you think it's more visual, or do you think they can they can smell a hatch? I think it's visual. I, I'm not an entomologist by training, <laughs> although I, I study bugs a lot. I don't have any evidence that would support uh, an olfaction component when the uh, trigger uh, is right, whether that's a day length or temperature, uh, where the you know say the pale morning guns all start to hatch. Uh, and you see that hatch starting. I, I think it's more of a visual cue. Uh-huh. We know that activity of those insects increases on the bottom, like the nymphs on the bottom start to move more, move from the bottoms of rocks to the top of rocks. Uh, and then as they sort of craft an air bubble to help the system to the surface, I think it's the movement that cues the start of that hatch. And that's why I think we see trout as ready for it. They, they know that's happening because they sense that movement as the insects are preparing to start that hatch process. Okay. That's what I've always suspected, but um, I'm glad to hear that there's some scientific validation of that, uh, of that theory. Mm-hmm. So now let's move on to hearing. And in particular, I'm thinking of... Um, the noises we make when wading and um, clicking uh, studded soles against rocks. I've, sure. I, I have I have read, and I, I'd like to get some some um, of your input on this. I've read that trout do not have very good long distance hearing, so that the sound of, of metal studs on rocks doesn't carry very far. It carries far, but the trout don't hear it. Is, it. is that true, or was I fed false information? Well, you know, I think that there's a, <coughs> there's a lot of information out there, and, and the interpretation of scientific information can take a number of different um, approaches, depending on the person that's interpreting it. Trout certainly, and fish in general, can hear well. They live in an aqueous environment. Uh, we know that water carries sound really well. Uh, when you're scuba diving, one of the ways that you can uh, um, alert other people in your group is to simply bang on your tank, like with the back of a dive knife, and that travels so far underwater. Mm-hmm. So trout have the ability to hear, 
in that environment really well. Now that's accomplished through an inner ear. Um, there's a, a pair of bones in the uh, head of a trout and in, in all bony fish called the otolith. These are a, a small sort of oval-shaped bone suspended in a almost like a jelly, and it helps them maintain orientation. It's, it's an accelerometer for them, so they understand how fast they're moving relative to the medium they're in. It also vibrates as sound waves hit it. So living in that aqueous environment as sound travels through pressure waves, as those pressure waves hit a fish, you know, it vibrates through them, it vibrates those otoliths, so it alerts them to a sound. It also provides them some information about the direction uh, from where that sound came from, although from my understanding, fish aren't super great at determining location from a given sound, but they, they do hear well. I think the problem with trout using sound like the, the sound of the cleats placking over cobble as someone is wading through a riffle uh, on their way to, you know, fish a pool or to reach some water in a run, <laughs> is that they can't, they don't necessarily make the association between that sound, though they may hear it, and a fisherman. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I think that they can, they can be trained to associate a sound with something. So, for an example... Uh, some hatcheries are working on pairing a low frequency sound with feeding in a distinct area within the hatchery. So you could imagine a very large tank complex, and when it's feeding time, food is dropped into a particular area of a tank, and it's accompanied by a sound. This is classic Pavlovian conditioning. And the reason that this can be useful is if you get an escape from, say, a net pen, we have shown, the science has shown, that playing that sound that, that indicates feeding can actually recall many of those fish, and salmonids in particular uh, are very adept at making that association. I did a similar experiment with my, during my PhD, where I uh, made fish engage, trout engage in an aggressive social interaction, the conditioning element of that was turning off the water to the tank. And in fact, over a week, just a week of daily pairing, turning off the water to the tank would cause a, a smaller non-territorial trout to have a stress response. Huh. They anticipated this incoming <coughs> social interaction with a larger uh, pair as uh, uh, the water turning off. So they made that association. So I think they can connect them if we make them very obvious, but to a given 14-inch trout in a small stream somewhere, a cow or an elk walking across the a cobble uh, in, a, in a riffle is the same to them as a human walking across. They, they don't, it doesn't really provide any important information to them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they can hear our studs. How f how far do you know how far away they can hear the sound of studs on a rock? Well, you know, I, I don't have a specific number. As, you know, the specifics of that is is beyond me. But yep. uh, I do know it's it's farther than you think, right? Mm -hmm. But also remember this: if we're talking about a small stream, mid-sized stream, rocks are moving in that stream all the time, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? You're yep. getting current pulses and. Uh, logs are moving through and, and pushing up rocks and, and elk and moose are walking through and they're dislodging rocks and the force of water moving all the time. But, you know, of course, in the headwaters, you've got big rocks and in the lower reaches of the stream, you've got the small ones because they physically have broken down over time. Right. So they're surrounded <clears throat> by sound all the time. Now, metal on rock does make a distinct sound. The other one, and, and I get after people the, uh, on this in the boat, is stomping your foot in the bottom of a drift boat, maybe out of frustration or, you know, you're not paying attention or you bang your water bottle against the side of the drift boat. That's an unnatural sound to the trout, in it, and that does provide some information about something from above creating a sound. So I am pretty careful about uh, moving around a lot in a drift boat, I, I, you know, I, or using studs. I, if, we're, if we're moving between runs, like we're steelhead fishing, I'll always put a towel down where your feet are so that you're not 
engaging with the bottom of the boat and your studs uh, to make a bunch of racket. Well, the owner of the drift boat appreciates that towel, too. <laughs> That's a <fact. clears throat> Um, so compare that we talked about the Odala, compare that to the lateral line. Um, we hear that we hear that flies with deer hair heads or flies with palmered hackle create vibrations in the water that fish can detect in their lateral line. Is that is that true and is it valid? Is it a valid theory of, of fly selection? Yeah, there's no doubt we talk about push and how much water a fly pushes. And you, you think about some of those big streamers, deer hair streamers, that a guy like Kelly Gallup ties, and, and they look a lot like a sculpted in profile, but they have that ability to move water. Mm -hmm. uh, waking steelhead flies also uh, bring that to mind. And, and that's absolutely true. So the lateral line also plays a role in sensation, similar to the way that the otolith will pick up pressure. Uh, but... The uh, lateral line also picks up electrical stimuli. And so anytime neurons are firing, you've got a little bit of electrical activity. So, you know, you can imagine uh, a small bait fish that's been injured. It's doing a lot of rapid uh, movements, you know, flicking about. That is sending out electrical information. And the lateral line is keen on that, as well as uh, pressure movement. Um, indicating directionality. So I do think that there is something to uh, the ability of a fly to move water for a long range, a uh, longer range than vision um, awareness for the trout. But I think that once the trout has been alerted to the presence, they then switch to visual, which is their primary motivation for striking something. Do you think that there's a future for electric electric streamers that send out electrical pulses? <laughs> That's a very good question. I, <laughs> I do think that there is some interest there, and certainly anything that can um, improve our odds of hooking a big fish uh, is of interest. Um, I, I think that the technology to make something like that uh, that could end up in a log jam at the bottom of a of a river pretty quick is, is far along, but uh, we already do some of those things. If you look at conventional bass fishermen, you know, these guys put rattles in their lures of Virginia for quite a while. And actually I've seen some of the frogs that I buy at the fly shop have got rattles integrated into them now, these uh, flies. Yeah, yeah. And that is just about making sound and causing a disturbance. Mm -hmm. uh, but for notice, those are mostly for bass. Yeah. And so the, that hasn't really translated into the, the Salmonid world. I've never seen a streamer that had a rattler in it that was, you know, a steelhead streamer or a trout streamer. Uh, but I, I do think for those ambush predators, something that causes an agitation and draws attention is a good thing. Oh, there, there are people who put rattles in trout streamers and in bonefish flies. Okay. I can I can tell you from personal experience. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And, you know, the bonefish flies also make sense to me, uh, particularly thinking about crabs. Yeah. Uh, the sound that those, the shell-on-shell -shell, right. uh, connection makes. Yep. You know, you can really hear that. I mean, you know, something like a mantis shrimp, of course, has got an incredible uh, snap rate. So that does make sense to me, uh, especially in that sort of wide open, not too... Um, currency of an environment that sound can travel a long way and, and they could localize to it so I think that that does stand to reason my friends laugh at me for my I use uh, I use glass there's a glass you can buy a glass dumbbell eye that has little BBs in it and um, they make rat little tiny rattles and I have a very good friend who's a who's a bonefish scientist and he laughs at my rattle crazy Charlie's but I use them <laughs> <laughs> I think confidence, too, in the fly is a big part of that. Yeah, right? And so yeah. uh, whether or not that actually translates into more takes or looks from a bonefish, I think is negligible if it causes you to fish it more and to be more confident in it. I think that's also great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
So um, you know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking an articulated streamer with a piezoelectric crystal in it that that sends off a pulse of electricity when that when that articulation uh, moves sideways. I'm 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 working on it. I'm working on it here in my. I in like my it. Head. You know, you could actually mirror that to the electrical signals given off by a wounded bait fish. Yeah. And, you know, a person could match that fairly easily. The power source behind that would be something we'd have to work on. Of course, the world's tiniest battery would be involved. But uh, I think that could be a, a million-dollar idea for us. Well, what about a piezoelectric crystal? Because you wouldn't need a power source then. It would just it would just give off the... It, when Whenever it was stressed, it would give off the uh, electricity, right? Now, that's why they pay you the big bucks. Well, just don't tell Kelly Gallup, or he'll be he'll be putting them in his streamers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's let's talk about vision and specifically, you know, color vision and UV vision in adult trout. Yeah, uh, you you mentioned something right there that that's an important element. You said an adult trout, right? I did, really I did that on purpose. I did that on yeah, purpose. Yeah, I can tell. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, there's a, you know, for people that don't know, there there is a controversy out there in the world right now around UV uh, vision in trout. Uh, there was a, there's a couple of papers that have been published that show that a rainbow trout at the par stage, uh, you know, small rainbow trout have the ability to see see in the UV spectrum very well, and there's some indication that that is useful for them as their primary prey items are things like, you know, Daphnia and other zooplankton that reflect UV uh, light uh, uh, very well, and so it helps them key in on those prey items, but then it's also been shown that adults lose that ability uh, for the most part, and and we're talking particularly about trout here, and, and one of the reasons that we're talking about trout is that, you know, any any research that you do, you've got to have a model organism to do that, and those model organisms have to be fairly well studied so that you understand the systems intact. And so, you know, the most popular fish in research by far is the zebrafish. Mm-hmm. And we've got the genome sequenced, and I could make you a zebrafish right now that has, you know, uh, serotonin neurons that glow in a, a certain region of the brain because we have the, the genetic tools to do that. We don't necessarily have the genetic tools to do that with rainbow trout, but the beauty of the rainbow trout is we can very easily culture them. Um, we're, we're very adept at raising rainbow trout, at uh, breeding them in, in hatcheries and, and raising them up. So they're a very common study species. I, I use rainbow trout for my model organism uh, for, for many years. Um, the, the issue behind whether or not they see UV light as adults is important because there's a, you know, the idea that if you could find the materials in your fly time that match the hatch exactly right, you'll get fewer refusals and more pickups. And this first idea that trout can see in the UV spectrum really sort of fired up the, the UV sensitive, uh, UV reflecting materials. <clears throat> but then once it was sort of further explored and we and, and we realized that that largely is lost in the adult fish, then there became a question of, well, what is the utility then of having UV reflecting materials and fly time uh, of interest, a steelhead, you know, uh, that runs out to the ocean when it comes back. And, and the same is true with salmon when they come back from the ocean they regrow the ability in their uh, cones to uh, to see UV light again. And ah. so some of that sensitivity comes back. Ah. Um, steelhead in particular, you know, you can always tell a steelhead fly because it's bright. It's got a lot of fluorescent colors. The steelhead likes shiny things. And those fluorescent colors, those brighter colors, tend to have a UV reflectance. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And so, you know, there, there's something to be said there about uh, the, those returning fish and, and what they're seeing in that UV spectrum. Um, and I think that's something that we've known 
already. I don't think people always use bright colors for Steelix flies, but I think we probably learned over time that they selectively uh, chose those flies. And when you think the comparison to, you know, a, a, just a river dwelling rainbow trout, it's quite a distinction in the color palette that we use compared to a steelhead. Mm. So the, the adult trout, as far as I know, has a very limited ability to see UV light uh, in a given day. Now, that ability isn't completely gone, and they can see in the UV spectrum, uh, but it's not their primary mode of vision. Mm -hmm. It's enhanced in low light conditions uh, in the early morning, in the evening. In fact, that's where um, fish are feeding heavily as well in those time periods, so it may play a role there because there's more UV light available. Uh, but in my professional opinion, it's not as big of a deal as the fly shop material uh, stock might suggest. Well, you know, I mean, the fact that fish may be able to see UV um, doesn't mean that doesn't mean that we're imitating. I mean, we we'd have to check the UV reflectance of all the bugs, right? And to match that to whatever UV the fish can see. And, um, you know, fish can see blue and pink too, but bl just because they can see it doesn't mean blue and pink flies are going to work any better. Right. Right. And, and, you know, what sort of complicates this whole thing is, and this is coming from someone who has a PhD studying rainbow trout brains, Trout are kind of dumb. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's not a lot going on up there. They have a fairly simple, you know, life history strategy. And mostly what they do is hold just off the current and eat bugs that come by on the conveyor belt. Yeah. And, and as I said, you know, if you watch any of these videos of, of trout underwater, and of course there are a lot of people out there taking them, um, you know, taking video of, of holding fish and, they eat just about everything that comes by, and they're very opportunistic. Uh, of course, tell that to someone that fishes a lot of spring creeks, you know, and there are times when fish can be, they can be maddeningly selective. Yeah. But for most of their life, they're not that selective. I think that they're looking for approximations of size, shape, uh, movement, and then color as well, but I, I think color is, is fairly on the list. That changes when you move from a more riverine, current-based environment to a, a spring creek that's slower, where trout have more time to investigate, and you know, still water, of course, falls into that category. Uh, once they have more time to investigate, they can be a little bit more discerning. But in a given syst river system, the, these fish are aggressive. It's a competition for resources. They tend to eat first and ask questions later. Uh huh. So why are they still so difficult to catch, even in faster current on some days? Yeah, well, on some days, they really get into a pattern of what they're looking for, uh -huh. right? And uh -huh. so this is why we talk a lot about rise forms. You might be seeing a, a beautiful blueing olive hatch coming off, and you might be seeing the surface uh, dimpled, and, and you're thinking to yourself, this is perfect. I've got a hatch. I've got trout coming up to feed on adults. You're tying on a, a comparable dry fly pattern. It's about the same size. It's about the same shape. It's about the same color. And you don't get any fish to rise to it. Yep. What, I've been there. What's happening? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Haven't we all? <laughs> uh, I, I think that, that for the most part, what's happening there is those fish aren't eating the adults on the surface they're eating emergers that are stuck in that surface film. Uh -huh. And so by paying attention to the rise form, you can learn about that subtle difference. So, you know, if you, if you take a, a Ralph Cutter is a, is a guy that I really love, a Sierra fly fisherman, and, and he's, he's the kind of guy that makes these observations. And, you know, you can simply take a, your, your dry fly and, and cut the hackle off so that it rides lower down in the film. Yep and instantly change your odds, right? Mm -hmm. Or put yep. on an emerger that's suspended by a clump of CDC, but the, the rest of the body is hanging down 
in the in the film and then start getting those takes. And I think the reason is that they have they've cued in on a particular strategy that allows them to get maximum food with minimum effort. Mm-hmm. And if, if that is feeding just below the surface at those insects stuck in the film, then there's no reason for them to come up and occasionally eat an adult. Mm-hmm. So it's really about our understanding of the trout behavior that makes it difficult to catch. So it's really on us. It's not on them, right? They're not intentionally trying to foil our plans. They just are focused on one particular thing. But, but it's interesting because we're talking about a hatch. So during a hatch, we see there's a lot going on, and it doesn't make sense that they wouldn't be eating these strides because they're everywhere. But take that hatch away and put a dry fly in that same run, and you might get fish to rise to it several times. Yeah. Because they're not focused on one particular pattern. They're just there. And they're, Ooh, piece of candy. Ooh, piece of candy. You know, and they just jump up and take it. Uh huh. And so that's another part of it. Now, for, for me, when I see a hatch, often the first thing I'll do is swing a soft tackle through it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? Because you've got that mimicking of the insect, and we talked about how, you know, the idea, can a trout smell the hatch coming on? No, in my opinion, but they're certainly seeing emergers rise as nymphs from the bottom to to the surface uh, meniscus and then break through. And so when you see a, a soft tackle come and, and swing across the current and rise up, that's a trigger. And so you'll often get takes on, on those soft tackles during the start of that hatch, or even when, even when they're taking adults at the surface, because you've triggered that feeding behavior with a movement. What I've never been, understand, been able to understand is insects, when they hatch, don't swing across current lanes. They, they, they can't, you know, they can't move from one lane to another. It's like being on an interstate with lots of traffic, right? Right. Why will they eat a soft hackle that's swinging across current lanes when it doesn't look natural? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, and what you're getting at there is this fly isn't behaving in the same way that a natural would behave. No. But what's happening is that movement is triggering the, the feeding response. And so, you know, I've often thought about that, the unnaturalness. Now, they can, the insects can move quite a bit, particularly when they, you know, they develop an air bubble that's helping them move up to the surface, but they're not moving across lanes. Right. But that movement is the key element. Again, these trout are kind of dumb. <laughs> so it's, it's not that they're saying to themselves, wow, this guy just went from the hammer lane to the slow lane. You know, that's weird. I better not eat it. They're seeing that here's a piece of food that is moving away from me, uh-huh. and rising in the water column, boom, I've got to eat that thing. Uh-huh. So it's more about finding that, those triggering responses. And that's sort of the beauty of, and also the frustration of tying your own flies. You might tie a pattern that is just fire. The, the freestyle, the whatever you did, it works really, really well for fish in a given situation. But you might never understand what exactly about that fly made it work so well. Like yeah. You might say, my crazy Charlie works so well because I've got these special glass metal eyes with rattles in them. Uh-huh. But it also might be because you have a package of 25-year-old dubbing that was just hanging around in your bag for a long time. You know me. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're using that, and it turns out that the spectral qualities of the, of the dye that was used in that dubbing really reflects the naturals in the area that you're fishing uh-huh. quite well. Uh-huh. And that might be the trigger. Uh-huh. And you might find out that you, you run out of that dubbing and, and you buy a, another batch that's a pretty close match and they never work the same, uh-huh. right? And so you, you yeah. might never make that connection to what the actual trigger was. Uh, and so it's, it's very interesting. I, I fish a lot of Turks tarantulas. It's mm-hmm. yeah. one of my favorite patterns for mm-hmm. small streams. A yep. uh, good friend of mine was a guide on the Teton River Lodge for, you know, 10 years or something out of college. And 
he loves to fish the church tarantula, and he fishes them red with a red body. Yeah. He calls it the bloody Turks, and he just loves the bloody Turks. And it's bizarre because well, there's nothing that looks like that anywhere, ever. Yeah. But it works really well, and the more fish you catch on it, the more torn up it gets, the better it fishes. And it's just such an interesting thing that it's it's probably not the color at all. It's just the fact that it's something that, that the fly itself is triggering a response in the fish, and and that's what's working. It's probably not the red at all. It could be yellow, and it'd be just fine. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But he believes in it, so he uses red. Bingo. Yeah. They'll probably kill me for saying that. Well, you know, it, it may, it, there may be something to it, because I remember many years ago, uh, a friend of mine who grew up in Jackson swore by red ants. And I don't mean like cinnamon ants. I mean he would tie these red ants with bright red bodies. And and he swore by it. So, you know, maybe there is something about red in that particular part of the world, or maybe red and cutthroat trout. Who knows? Right. So there you go. See, so now we made this assumption together at the start of this conversation. And we said, well, we're talking primarily about rainbow trout. We're going to assume that the same is true for brown trout and brookies and cutthroat. But there's a, out here in the West, everyone knows that cutthroat trout, particularly the coastal cutthroat trout, really do well in purple. Uh-huh. Purple is the color for, for coastal cutthroat trout. Uh-huh. And, of course, purple's kind of catching on in, in a lot of different trout patterns. But maybe there is something particular to the way that division works for these fish, for those cutthroats in the Snake River system, maybe it's suspended particulate matter in the water column, which influences the way in which they see color, that makes them more prone to liking red. Uh, there are just so many variables out there. That's the wonder of science. It's also sort of the maddening part of science, is that it, it could be anything. And <laughs> to find out is is daunting at, at times and impossible. Well, it's the it's the part that keeps us coming back, right? The mystery and the wonder and uh, you know, never knowing, never being able to predict what's what's going to work. Right, right. If we could figure it out, it wouldn't be that much fun. No, it's true. It's it's never fun when it's uh, when it's too easy. And and part of that is also what I love about tying flies is that you're you're completely free to do whatever you want. Yeah. And and let the fish decide, right? If if what you've got works, keep doing that. Mm-hmm. Keep working through things, and and importantly, as we we brought up several times, if you have confidence in what you're doing, a, a lot of the time it's not necessarily the flying. And I hear this all the time. Uh, it's not as the the pattern isn't as important as the presentation. And so, making sure that you understand where where is a fish going to be, where's a prime lie in this particular stretch of water, how can I position my fly? in a way that most closely represents what the natural uh, prey item would be doing. And and I think that's like 95% of the battle right there, particularly mm-hmm. in moving water, because they could just a, a split second to make a decision, eat or not eat. Yeah. Except when the water's really cold. <laughs> then they don't eat. <laughs> <laughs> They don't eat, or when the pressure has come in, uh, we had a, a big system moving through what I was fishing two weeks ago, and the pressure, you know, was was out of whack. And these fish have swim bladders, and those affects their buoyancy. And so, you know, something like pressure can put them off of the feeding for a while. The temperature can put them off. It can be too hot. It can be too cold. There's a big swing. That's the other sort of crazy part of of sport that we love so much so you that, that's a good that's a good point you believe that barometric pressure not the not the accompanying wind or change in light you believe that barometric pressure by itself affects fish feeding absolutely i do uh-huh. i believe it's a huge predictor and i've seen it when fishing on like an extended trip and you've got a system that runs through and you get a big pressure drop or you get an increase in pressure. It, it can influence fish behavior, and I think, and I don't have the you know the scientific sources to point to, but in my professional opinion, it takes time for them to readjust 
mm-hmm. and it makes them uncomfortable, and it can put them off the food. Hmm. So even now, so, so let's say you got a fish. You got a fish in four feet of water, right in the current, and when it rises to the surface, doesn't that pressure change a lot more than than a weather pressure change? Isn't it? Isn't the magnitude much greater? In in four feet of water, it's not. It's a negligible change. It is. Um, yeah. Okay. In moving up and down. Okay. Um, you, you're not. You're not even an atmosphere there. So, um, you know, when you're moving in, in a lake or something in, in deeper water where it could be ten or twelve feet, you've got a, a difference there too. But I think it's more about the atmospheric pressure in a larger sense than the acuteness of moving up and down uh-huh. very quickly. Okay. And so I, I, it's more about that larger scale change. And it just takes a little bit of time. Now, something like a goldfish or, or some of these other teleosts, they can actually come up to the surface and slurp water or slurp air down and or burp it out and change the pressure in their air bladder. Uh-huh. But a, a trout doesn't have that ability, so there it's fixed. Yeah. And so it takes some time for that to dissipate out or, or for, for more to, to move in through osmotic pressure. So it, it takes time for them to adjust. And I believe that puts them off the feeding and they just find a, a you know, sheltering lie and, and just take it easy for a bit and, and wait for that adjustment. Well, you have totally changed my view of the effects of barometric pressure on trout fishing or fishing in general. Wonderful. I've learned something. I've learned a valuable lesson today. Not that it's going to make my fishing any better or worse, but at least it gives me an excuse now. Yeah, it's just something to point out. Damn that barometric pressure. Yeah, yeah. I never, I, I never believed that it would have that much effect. But um, you're the one who's, you're the one who's studied fish, and and so I'm changing my tune. That's great. And I love being able to pull out that fish neuroscientist card from time to time yeah no that's pretty cool how about how about the how about the effect of moon what do you think about the effect of a full moon versus a new moon on uh fish feeding well we know for a fact that the moon has a significant effect on tidal shifts and the way the water flows tidal shifts yeah but let's say in fresh water so that stands true in fresh water as well. Just the daily cycle, we talk a lot about the the crepuscular nature of fish coming out and feeding right at the edges. So as we move from night to, to day and from day to night, those evening and morning stretches where we're getting change in light. Yep. One of the things that we know to be true is that the uh, influence the, the lunar influence on flow is most significant then in a moving water system because you're at the competition point where you're switching from the moon phase to the sun phase, right? They're moving at that particular time. And so the gravitational influence uh, reaches its, its highest point there at that competition. And so what we know is insects in a stream you might think of a mayfly when you flip over a rock and you've got a bunch of, of mayfly uh, nymphs clinging to it, right? And yeah. you might think to yourself, wow, what a small world that this mayfly lives in. And it just lives on this rock and then at some point, you know, in a year after it's, you know, grown to, to a, an adult size, it's going to form an air bubble and shoot up to the surface and break out of this husk and become a winged adult. But the truth is, is that they do move through a system. Uh, they could be intentionally dislodged and move downstream, and they tend to do that in those crepuscular time periods. Mm-hmm. So they do it when they have the greatest opportunity to take advantage of of that change in flow. Mm-hmm. And so that's also why fish have a, a tendency to feed in those time periods, because there's more food available to them. Right. And that change in effect is greater when you've got a full moon versus a new moon because that gravitational influence is more significant. Really? So I'm always an advocate for fishing right at that transition. I love to get out to the creek where it's actually still too dark to even see. And you just, you know, you sit in your truck and have a little bit of coffee and 
you know, think ahead to the day, and then just when it's starting to get light enough to see, you rig up and, and you walk out and, and you start fishing. I always tend to do really well at those time periods, and it's this phenomenon that I believe is the reason behind that. Okay, so I, I get the change in light and behavioral drift and all that, but the moon affects drift as well? It's that gravitational shift from the moon being the primary influence to the sun being the primary influence. And so just like how the, the moon, the lunar cycle influences the tides four times a day, yeah, there is still that competition of influence for flowing water systems, although it's not as great. Uh, it, it still does have an impact on them. So it has that same crepuscular nature. As, as the sun and moon change, so too does that in, uh, influence that the moon exerts. And so I believe that that is, is the responsible element for that, that subtle shift. So it's in, not the light, it's, it's not the light of the full moon, but it's the gravitational pull? Bingo. Huh. You know, so it used to be like the worst case scenario when I was growing up, you know, in rural northeastern California up in the high desert. It, if there was a full moon, the first weekend of deer season, everyone was so bummed out because there's enough light at night for the big bucks to go out and eat their fill of alfalfa or, you know, oats or apples or whatever they're feeding on, and then go bed down and stay uh, in their bed all day. Right, right, right. And so we knew that that allowed them to be out at night and to do the things they can do, although they can see fairly well in the dark, but there are other things that come out to feed on deer at night as well, right? And so it was always like the death knell for that first week in season to have a full moon. But I, I don't think the same is true of trout. For instance, I don't think that they feed more at night when there's a full moon, thus they feed less during the day. I think it's more about that, uh, the rhythmicity of change that influences that crepuscular feeding. Not to say that trout don't feed at night. They do, and they can, uh, particularly in... Uh, you, where you might have a little bit more light, right? Where uh, there's mm-hmm. a lot of uh, of diffuse starlight, or uh, where there's a lot of activity at night. They a lot of uh, rodents, you know, in, in Alaska or in Russia, when you get a lot of mice that are active at night, you've got big trout that come out and do damage on those things. But for the most part, trout are you know daytime sight oriented feeders, right? And so it, it is. It's the light that comes there in the morning, but of course in the evening we're losing that light. It is more about the behavior of their prey items that's influencing that than anything else. Mm-hmm. So does so? I'm still not. I'm still not quite. I'm still not quite getting the whole gravitational effect of the moon um, on on insect behavior. Mm-hmm. I'm. St- so I think it's like in the middle of the day, a, a mayfly nymph could just climb to the top of the rock that it's clinging on, and uh, it could just let go. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and move downstream and and hopefully you know uh, slam into a rock or find a little eddy or something and sink down to the bottom and boom now it's got a new rock that it can live on. Right. Uh, that's a high risk behavior in the middle of the day. Right earlier in the morning or right there in the evening as as we've got a change from from the sun phase to the moon phase as the sun is setting and the moon is rising or vice versa there's a, a sort of slackening of the flow it's still there's still flow but you could imagine if you put some dye in a stream and you were watching it above like from a drone you could pretty easily see the main current line on a, on a daily flow, you could just you could watch where that dye flows. You could say, "Oh, here's here's the way the current moves through that stream." As we reach those crepuscular periods, it would be more of a diffuse flow. So it would still be going in the same direction, but the the amplitude sort of smooths out a little bit, and there it's not as direct and tight of a line. And wow. So I believe that insects use that opportunity to move downstream 
and they can they can have a better chance of settling out somewhere rather than getting washed down a far distance because they're helpless in the current. Okay, so at those crepuscular times, the gravity, the gravitational effect is less because they're it's not less. they're not directly overhead or underfoot. They're at, mm-hmm. at the margins. Yeah, there's competition between those two celestial bodies. Wow! And so it sort of equals each other out. Wow, boy, you're changing my whole you're changing my whole philosophy of things now, Russ. God, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Awesome. I'm going to be really thinking about this. I'm going to be really thinking about it. Yeah, that's the beauty of the the uh, sport of fly fishing is that you know I have found that the more I learn, the more stuff I realize is out there. Yeah. And you know it's it's great. It's it's a growth mindset and bringing a growth mindset in, into your life. I think is really important, and that's one of the things I love about teaching fly fishing. One is that it's it's really hard. It's hard to learn how to cast, and people think it's easy. They they're like, oh yeah, that seems like you know you could figure that out, but you can't. Of course, it takes a long time, and so I love pushing up against those preconceptions, but also showing the depth and breadth of, of information that is present in something that seemingly as simple as fly fishing and just fishing, right? Yeah. Uh, that there's a, there's a whole ecosystem component. There's, you know, we're, we're talking about UV reflection and, and rods and cones and trout eyes and, you know, development of the brain over time and, you know, thinking about otoliths today, for goodness sakes. And, you know, here's an interesting <laughs> fact that I, I did mention about otoliths. You can take that ear bone out of a bony fish you can slice a thin segment of it, put it under a microscope, and you can age a fish just like you would age a tree ring. Yeah, I've done it with bone. Right? So, I've done it with bonefish. Yeah, awesome! Isn't that so interesting? Yeah, and much like a tree ring, you can tell when there's been years of plenty and when there have been years that were slim. Yep. And you can tell a ha- and you can tell a hatchery fish from a wild one because you, c- you can see the slowdown in the growth rings at a certain point in its life when it was stocked. Amazing. Cool stuff. Well, I may have to get you on again and blow some holes through some more theories. <laughs> Sounds great, Tom. I'm always interested. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, this has been this has been really fun, Russ, and um, I. I know that I, that I've learned a ton, and I'm sure that the the listeners have also got a lot of stuff rolling around in their brains right now to think about the next time they uh, they go fishing. So, um, really appreciate you you sharing your knowledge with us. Not every day that we get to talk for to a Stanford scientist about fly fishing, so that's pretty cool. Thanks, Tom. I really appreciate it. I love your show. I love what you're doing. Your science communication is amazing, and I, I really want to give you uh, props for that. Thanks a lot for the work you do. We, I, I really love it. Well, I love it too. You know, I love the scientific part of it, and um, and you've really you've really increased our body of knowledge. So appreciate it. Thanks, Tom. Thank you for listening to the Orvis Fly Fishing Guide podcast with award-winning fly fishing author Tom Rosenbauer. Have a question for the show? Call our listener line at 802-362-8800. Get more fly fishing tips at howtoflyfish.orvis.com. The music from our show is by Simplified. I'm Greg Cutler with Birch Tree Productions. The Orvis Fly Fishing Guide podcast is produced by Hathaway Communications. <laughs>